Hello everyone and welcome to Cup to Hook Bible Chats. My name is Cynthia with Cynthia's Joyful Creations and today we are looking at Proverbs chapter 29 and it has a total of 27 verses I believe. Yes, 27 verses. This is the last chapter that Solomon writes in the book of Proverbs. The last two chapters, chapters um, 20, or excuse me, 30 and 31. Chapter 30 is written by a prophet named Agur, Agur, A-G-U-R. And chapter 31 is written by a prophet named Lemuel. And the last two chapters of Proverbs are my absolute favorite. So I hope that you will come back and join me next Friday and the following Friday and not miss those chapters because they are the absolute best. And Proverbs has already revealed to us that it is a great book in the Bible. We had a lot to learn about wisdom and discernment and how to properly use it. But I love the way these two prophets come and deliver a message repeating a lot of what Solomon has already taught us. Um, but I just love their style of teaching. So please come back and join us. Let's go ahead and start off with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for this Friday afternoon and this time that we've set aside to study your word, Lord, to not only read it, but to grow with it, Lord, and to allow it to absorb into our lives and to reflect from us so that you might be glorified and that when others look at us, they see you. Father, thank you for the things that you teach us, the things that you want us to do and the things that you want us to refrain from doing. Father, may we be diligent and listen and be servants that are willing to be obedient and willing to be corrected. Father, again, we just thank you for this time together and just ask that you bless it. Help us to block out all the distractions of the outside world and not to let the devil come in and be in our midst. Father, we love you so much, and we thank you that you are here, and indeed you are. And we ask all this in your name and your son's name. Amen. So let's start out with our opening song, and we're going to go ahead and sing it twice. Love them in the morning when you see the sun arising. Love them in the evening because he took you through the day. And in the in-between times when you feel the pressure coming. Remember that he loves you and he promises to stay. Love him in the morning when you see the sun arising. Love him in the evening cause he took you through the day. And in the in-between times when you feel the pressure coming. Remember that he loves you and he promises to stay. Let's go ahead right into Sanctuary. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. For you, the Hallmark song. Well, you know I love you, Jesus, but so often I don't say how you filled my life with love and joy each and every day. So I'm singing you this love song, and I hope that you will see. What I'm really giving you is all of me. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves all the people of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Amen. Jesus loves the people of the world. 
<clears throat> so chapter 29, Rulers, Servants, and the Fear of Men. So this is the last chapter that Solomon writes. The last two chapters that we will look at will come from the prophet Agur um, and then the prophet Lemuel. And I'm going to be honest with you, the last two chapters of Proverbs are my absolute favorite. And if you come and join me next Friday and the following Friday, you will clearly understand why. Not that Solomon has not done a great job because I would like to hope that as I have, that as we've been on this journey through Proverbs, that you have been able to feel the growth within your own life and that your ability to understand and discern and use wisdom has grown as well. So again, this is the last chapter that Solomon writes in the book of Proverbs. All right, so looking at verse 1. Whoever remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. Stiff neck means stubborn. So basically, anyone who remains stubborn after being corrected and they don't change and turn from their ways, this person lives like judgment is never going to come to them. But the Bible tells us, excuse me, even right there in the first verse, they will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. Nothing will be able to fix their outcome. Verse 2, when the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. When the wicked, wicked rule, the people groan. Governing should benefit the entire community, not just one self-interest. So in order to be a good leader, you have to serve others and not just your own needs. Verse 3, a man who loves wisdom brings joy to his father, but a companion of prostitutes squanders his wealth. Children of any age can bring happiness to their parents when they love and they live in wisdom. It gives patient, uh, parents excuse me, a, a, a justification a, a certain level of pride in their children. Not a pride that's destructive, but a pride that says, you know, I raised them well, and now we're living through the results of that. And this is a piece that, I mean, these parents have earned because it not only gives them a sense of pride in their children, but it gives them a piece about their child's future. The foolish, they just waste their wealth, okay? And in this example, it's talking about, you know, throwing it away on sex, on prostitution. Verse 4, by justice, a king gives a country stability, but those who are greedy for bribes will tear it down. A nation can expect strength and progress when it's ruled by justice, okay? To be ruled by justice means like evil doers are actually punished for their wrongs and they're restrained. And then there's also a fairness in the legal system. People can count on it. They can depend on it. They can expect a fair and just trial. And then agreements are honored. And for this justice, there will be a foundation for growth and blessing. But unfortunately, justice, it can be abused, and oftentimes it is, and it can be abused by bribes, and bribes can destroy the foundations of fairness and, and equality. All right, verse 5, those who flatter their neighbors are spreading nets for their feet. And basically what this means, flattery means to give attention 
to someone with the hope of gaining an inheritance or excuse me an influence or a status I apologize my eye was bother me but the wise they know how to avoid this trap they know how to see flattery for what it is it's one thing to genuinely give someone a compliment. It's one thing to genuinely encourage someone. Sorry. I just ate. <laughs> um, the devil. <laughs> Get behind us. Um, the wise are able to see through that. They're able to see that it's not genuine. They're able to see that there is some kind of motive or personal gain to be made by that flattery. I mean, if someone's never paid you any attention and you're around them a lot and then all of a sudden you're like their best friend and then they're like just, you know, praising you in ways that they never have, chances are they're, they're in it for themselves. They're trying to gain something. And the wise, they're smart to these traps. Because that's what flattery is. It's just a trap. There's a difference between flattery and a compliment. All right, verse 6. Evildoers are snared by their own sin, but the righteous shout for joy and are glad. A man may be evil in his character, but it is his actions that actually ruin him. If transgressions belong to the evil, then singing and rejoicing belong to the righteous. And it is an expression of what's inside them. So just like the transgressions that are seen in a person that declares them to be an evil person, the singing and the rejoicing in the righteous person, both of them are showing the kind of person that each of them individually are. And it shows what's inside of them. Verse 7, the righteous care about the poor, care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no concerns. Okay? In other words, the, the, wiki, the wicked, oh my goodness, you guys. The wicked do not even have pity on them. Okay? They care about where, excuse me, okay. The righteous do not show pity on the poor, okay? They actually care about the cause of why that person is poor, okay? They show that compassion. The wicked, I can't even read this. The wicked can't even begin to understand that kind of compassion. So, in other words, if someone comes to you and they're in need, okay, and they're crying and they feel hopeless and their kids are with them and they're starving, you're not going to help them because you feel sorry for them. You're going to help them because you have compassion. But rather than just trying to provide them a meal or help them get through the rough patch, you know, by providing them a meal, say twice a week, you're going to help them get to the cause of why they're in the situation that they're in while helping them to help get them out of this hole, so to speak, that they're in and how to cover the hole up so they don't fall into it again. All right. That's where it says the righteous care about justice for the poor. Verse 8, mockers stir up a city, but the wise turn away anger. Mockers, another name for mockers are scoffers, and they are the worst possible offenders. They bring judgment against the city, while the righteous help turn God's wrath away. When the wicked are committing sin after sin after sin, God gets angry with us. He gets angry with us for being disobedient. And 
he will bring wrath down on a city that just continues to be disobedient. But the righteous, they do things that actually turn God's wrath away, that makes God pleased. All right, verse 9. If a wise person goes to court with the fool, the fool rages and scoffs, and there is no peace. The wise person and the fool, they're going to argue, they're going to dispute. And the reason they're going to do this is because they have different foundation and principles. Their moral values are not on the same page. And so there's not going to be any peace. There's not going to be any resolution. They're going to have to go through the court system to gain the fairness. Both sides are going to have to be heard. Verse 10, the bloodthirsty hate a person of integrity and seek to kill the upright. Bloodthirsty means they're a violent person, okay? They cannot control their tongue. They cannot control their thoughts. They cannot control their actions. Integrity is someone who's honest, who has strong morals. And, and the, the wicked, they're, they're, they will try to kill someone of integrity because it, it reflects their personification and it makes them look bad. And you have to remember, when someone is, is evil, a wrongdoer, they tend to justify their actions to the fact that they don't think what they're doing is wrong. So when you have someone that comes around with honesty and integrity and they look better than them, then they have to do away with them. And a lot of times, killing was the way that they would do that. Verse 11, fools give full vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. Fools think that everyone is interested in their feelings. Fools think that everyone wants to sit around and listen to them vent, listen to them talk about themselves. But nobody wants to do that. But the foolish, that's how they feel. The wise know that there's a time and a place to vent. There's a time and a place to express one's feelings. But even when they do, they will never act like the fool. Verse 12, if a ruler listens to lies, all of his officials become wicked. Servants will follow their ruler. The wise ruler does not reward deception and keeps the atmosphere from becoming poisonous and incompetent. So a ruler who's wise, first off, is not going to listen to someone who's lying, who's trying to flatter. They're going to have discernment. And once they realize that this person is not speaking truthfully, they're going to silence them. A foolish ruler who doesn't silence them and listens and engages, their servants are going to follow. And so that's what that verse is saying. Okay. Um, if a ruler listens to lies, all of his officials will become wicked because they will follow along in his footsteps. So if he hushes and silences the wickedness, then his servants are going to be the same way, you know, and they're going to remain strong. But if he listens and even considers, then he's opening the door for weakness in his servants who are following his example. Verse 13, the poor and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives sight to the eyes of both. Wow. All intelligence is a divine gift. And it depends on whether or not we use that gift in righteousness or wickedness. Verse 14, if a king judges the poor with fairness, his throne will be established forever. 
the king or the leader must be careful to not show any partiality, but make judgment according to truth. And if they do this, their reign will be blessed and it will be blessed by God and it will be respected by the people. Verse 15, a rod and a reprimand impart wisdom, but a child left undisciplined disgraces his mother. We learn through correction, all of us. Jesus himself learned through suffering. We're going to flip over to Hebrews chapter 5 verses 8 and 9. Hebrews is in the New Testament and it is right before the book of James and it is right after the book of 2 Timothy. But Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8 and 9. And it says, Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. So, even Jesus had to learn. But where we learn through correction he learned through suffering. We should not despise God's use of the rod or rebuke because no one is above learning through discipline. Children who are not trained often will bring shame to their parents. So I don't know if we bring it up later in this chapter or not, but the bottom line is, is if you can't discipline your child because it's good for them, the Bible tells us to discipline them because it's good for us. When we teach them and we train them and we discipline them and we bring them up the right way, then chances are they're not going to stray from that. And therefore, they're going to please us. They're going to make us happy. They're not going to bring us heartache and struggle and strife and burden after burden. Verse 16, when the wicked thrive, so does sin, but the righteous will see their downfall. God is in control, and God is not going to allow the wicked to triumph. So, it says when they thrive, so does sin. That means when they're doing bad things, sin is just going to be like a domino effect. It's going to hit the next person and the next person or the next object or whatever. And it's going to create this big mass chaos. But God is in control and, and he's not going to allow that. And it says that the righteous will sit back and they will see them fall to their demise. Verse 17 is one of the verses that we are highlighting for this week. And it is... And it says, discipline your children and they will give you peace. They will bring you the delights that you desire. It's important to correct and train our children. If we leave them to their selves, their peer, the culture around them, then there will be, they will be an ongoing source of trouble and give their parents no rest. And here's where it is. If, if you won't correct your child because that correction is good for them, then do it because it is good for you. If you correct them as they make the mistakes and help them learn, then raising them will become easier because they'll learn to know what to expect and what not to do. But if you just let them get by with it, then it's harder and almost impossible to correct them 
the older they get. I remember I used to have friends that were like, um, how can you, how can you, you know, punish your son? How can you put him in time out? I'm like, how could I not? Oh, but he's so cute and so adorable. It just breaks my heart. Yeah, but what happens when that cuteness and that adorableness wears off and I'm dealing with this young man who acts like he has no upbringing, who treats people poorly because he was allowed to get away with things and not share his toys. Then it's not so cute and it's not so adorable. And then it's almost a little too late. So verse 17 is a verse that we're highlighting. Discipline your children and they'll give you peace that will bring you the delights you desire. Verse 18, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint, but blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. When God's word is abandoned, people have no restraint. And they lose God's favor and they lose God's protection. So there has to be revelation. There has to be restraint. Verse 19, servants cannot be corrected by mere words. Though they understand, they will not respond. Tough life experiences and discipline will more likely be your more teachable moments. You can tell somebody the difference between right and wrong. You can speak it to them. But until they actually go through a tough life experience or actually physically learn a mistake or an error or a poor choice in judgment, chances are they're not going to respond even though they understand. Verse 20, do you see someone who speaks in haste? There is no hope for a fool than for them. We've all seen it. We've all seen where someone lacking wisdom is impulsive in their speech. And when they are, they not only look ridiculous, they sound ridiculous, and then unfortunately, they can't undo the damage they've done. And they are a fool without hope. Verse 21, a servant pampered from youth will turn out to be insolent. And this is kind of going back to my friend saying, how can you put them in time out? They're so cute and adorable. Well, it's the same thing here. You know, if you pamper a servant and you make them attached to you, then they become like an obligation. And if they're given everything they want, they don't learn how to work for something. They don't learn how to earn it. They just expect it. They, they feel like they're entitled. And then that obligation becomes yours to clean up their messes, to clean up their mistakes, to right their wrongs. And then not only do they become your ob obligation, but then chances are they are looking to seek a part of your inheritance. So you need to be careful. The next verse is one of the verses that we're highlighting for today. We have three, and this is the second one. And it says, an angry person stirs up conflict and a hot-tempered person commits many sins. An angry person will spread his strife on others and not even care about it, not even think twice about it. And when he does, sin abounds, and the atmosphere is marked by a lack of self-control. And anytime I say he, 
Just know that that's plural, meaning he or she. It does not mean that only men commit these sins. Only men are these strong-necked, stubborn people. It includes women, too. So just understand that when, when we are discussing this. And the last verse that we're going to highlight is verse 23. And it says, Pride brings a person low, but the lowly in spirit gain honor. And that verse is pretty self-explanatory. Pride can make a person fall. But the ones who fall in spirit will gain honor. Verse 24, the accomplices of thieves in their own are, excuse me, the accomplices of thieves are their own enemy. They are put under oath and they dare not testify. And basically a person who steals from a person will also steal from their partner. But now when it comes to testifying, they will be loyal to their friend and not to God. In other words, they won't tell the truth. They'll tell whatever needs to be said to protect their, their friend, their partner. Verse 25, fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Verse 26 says, many seek an audience with a ruler, but it is from the Lord that one gets justice. Worrying about what other people think instead of God means that you seek man for justice. And not God. So we are not to worry about what other people think. If we're living in God's grace, then that's all that matters. What other people think does not matter. But yet, we give them that power. And when we give other people that power, we also give the devil that power. Verse 26, many seek an audience, okay, with the ruler, but it's from the Lord that one gets justice. Okay, we already talked about that. Seeking justice from man and not God. The last verse, verse 27, the righteous detest the dishonest and the wicked detest the upright. And that's pretty self-explanatory. Sorry about that. That's pretty self-explanatory. The righteous don't like the wicked. They don't want to associate with them. They don't want to be brought down into their chaos and their, their messy world. And the wicked, they detest the upright because their reflection on them makes them look bad. It brings their darkness to light. It brings their nastiness to purity. And, and there's just no equality there. They're on two opposite sides of the spectrum. And it goes back to the very beginning. They have a difference in foundation and, and morals. Those without integrity do not like those with integrity. Those with integrity do not like those without integrity. So I felt like that was a good way for Solomon to wrap up the book of Proverbs for us under his teaching. And again, I am so, so excited about the, the final two chapters, chapter 30 and 31. Again, these, these chapters are written by the prophet Agur and the prophet Lemuel. And they have a lot to say, but they also kind of reiterate a lot of what Solomon is saying. So therefore, it's kind of to like impress upon our hearts and our lives that these are the things that we need to be living by. And these are the things we need to be staying away from. And so again, they will 
give us the warnings we need, but they'll also explain the magnific magnificent, magnificent things about life and God's blessings. So I am so excited that we're finally here. I cannot wait for the next two weeks to finish this up. And then as a reminder, we will be moving on to the book of Esther. But before we close, I wanted to just kind of give you a couple examples of ways that we cover our sin. Like when we're ashamed, how, how do we cover our sin up? And this is a good way to kind of, even though we still got two chapters of Proverbs, you know, we're kind of closing up Solomon's teachings. And so in honor of him, what are ways that we try to cover up our sin? We do it by excuses and justifications. We do it by secrecy. We do it by lies. We do it by schemes to evade or avoid responsibility, time, tears, and we hide behind ceremonies or sacraments. And while we might fool others, we never can fool ourselves or God. And while sometimes we can tell ourselves something over and over and over that the mind will start to believe the untruth. But God, no matter what, always sees and knows the truth and will in his time bring the truth to light. So my friends, the biggest thing that I ask you to take away from this as you truly put on wisdom every single day is to admit that you're a sinner. Admit that you need the Lord in your heart. Admit that you are a sinner that needs to be saved by grace and that grace needs to be acknowledged by the death of God's Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross who shed His blood died and rose again to cover every sin that we've ever committed and every sin that we are going to commit and that we have yet to commit. We need to recognize our sin. And if we can, we need to stop doing it, repent, turn away from it, and try to do it no more. But if for any reason we commit that sin again. We need to seek forgiveness. We need to God, ask God for forgiveness and continue to try not to do that sin and repeat it, to try not to give excuses or justifications, to try not to hide it in secrecy or lie about it, to not come up with schemes to avoid the consequences of it, to not allow time and tears and and emotions to bury it or cover it and definitely not to hide behind church or Christianity because the realization is none of us are perfect and we are all sinners saved by grace God's grace all right well I cannot wait to come back and talk about chapter 30 next week. We will look at um, Agur, Agur first, A-G-U-R. He is the first prophet that we will be looking at. And um, in chapter 30, there are 33 verses. And we will not necessarily be going through them verse by verse. We'll be doing them in sections. Of verses so yeah I'm excited all right so we're gonna take a few minutes and just play some soft quiet music and let the prayer request come up on the screen and again you can take pictures of those with your um, phone you can do a screenshot if you want and that way you have them but please please pray for these folks um, they wouldn't give us their name or prayer request if they weren't asking for prayer. And if there's anything that we can pray for you about, 
please feel free to put it in the comment section. And if it's something that you want me just to pray about, then you can email me or exchange phone numbers and we can talk and pray together over the phone. All right, so let's just take a minute and look at our prayer requests for today. that you had an opportunity to get those names and those requests and let's go to the Lord in prayer Father God thank you so much for everything that you have taught us in Proverbs and while we still have two chapters left to go from the prophets of Gior and Lemur Father we thank you for Solomon and we thank you for his willingness to prophesy all the things that you wanted to teach us about wisdom. Lord, here is a man who gave in to the sins of his heart, who strayed away from you and who made poor decisions. Father, who definitely at one point had a life that was not worth following or listening to, but Father, you are the God of forgiveness and love and grace, and you can take the lowliest sinner and turn their life around, Lord, and bless them and use their testimony to bring others to you. Father, may our imperfect lives be a testimony to others. May the things that we've gone through, may we not show shame, but sh may we show strength and courage, Lord, and that through you, we might bless someone else and help pull them through a rough patch, poor decisions that they have made in their life. Lord, take the ugly and the sin in our life and help us turn it around in a way that glorifies you. Help us every day to stand up and get up out of bed, put our two feet on the ground, make the devil sh you know, shake and tremble because we are getting up 
with the armor of you and we are wearing wisdom and we're taking it into the world and we're taking it into our life and our daily activities and father we are using it and we're using it wisely continue to help us to know when to be silent and when to speak when to show anger and when to show love when to show discernment and when to show correction father we love you so much we have presented before you names of people that we love and care about who are going through things lord where they just need a helping hand they need to feel your presence they need to feel your love and your grace and your mercy and your healing lord may you touch them in a mighty way and may you help cleanse their thoughts heal their bodies father help them clear out the cobwebs of decisions that they're trying to make and have discernment father if they're searching for something help them find it if they're in need of something help them get it if they're lost lord help them be found if they're sad lord help them find happiness and joy if they're hurting lord bring them comfort and ease their pain if they're searching for answers lord may you provide them in the timing in the way that's right for them i love how recently you have reminded us that when it feels like the world is falling apart around us that in your plan it is not falling apart but falling into place what a reassurance what a joy that is father recently we celebrated you know the resurrection of your son and we thank you so much for the love that you have for each and every one of us to sacrifice him for all of the ugliness in us while we are so unworthy you find us worthy enough and father he loved you enough that he went through with it and you comfort him you comforted him all the way up through it and father the love that he has for us is because of the love that he sees in you towards us thank you so much for the friends that you have brought together here today the friendships that you are building through this time together may we continue to love one another and lift one another up to be there for one another to be the strength when we're weak to lean on one another when we just can't bear it to laugh with one another when we have joy and happiness to share praises to sing and above all thank you for being right here with us right in the middle loving each and every one of us and taking care of us we love you so much and we ask all this in your name and your son's name may the road rise to meet you may the wind blow at your back may the sun shine warmly on your face may the rain fall softly on your fields and until we meet again may god hold you in his hands ah oh, what a beautiful day thank you so much for being here with me i appreciate you stopping by and finishing up solomon's teachings for us in the book of proverbs i hope you'll come back over the next two weeks as we completely finish the book of proverbs and as we prepare our hearts for what God wants to teach us through the short, tiny book of Esther. I love you. Have an amazing week. Be joyful. Find that joy. It is there in abundance. So let your joy tank overflow. Share it with others. And as I say, find your joy, share your joy, and be joy to someone else. I love you so much. Mwah. Hugs, everyone. And I'll see you next Friday. Bye.